All right, so without further ado, um, this presentation will be recorded. This is going on to Green Mountain Access Television, so we're thankful for them for being here so we can share this with the, the bigger community. And it is my pleasure as our first speaker to welcome Dr. Bill Landesmith. He is Associate Professor of Biology right here on the NVU Johnson campus, and he is going to talk to us today, give us a little bit of background on, on um, where he's come from, new to our faculty, this year um, and talk to you about his research. So thank you very much for joining us today and I will hand it over to you. Well, thanks, uh, Dr. Tarleton. Uh, it's great to see all of you and a lot of familiar faces already. Thanks for coming out. Um, and this is my um, first semester here at, at NBU Johnson and I am really having a great time. Um, you know, especially today, right, going completely remote and looking at all the rectangles again. No, I'm just kidding. But um, it's been a great experience, um, including this transition was okay. Everyone was a good sport about it. Um, I am going to uh, share my screen here. And I should say hello to everyone out there on TV who's watching this, thanks for tuning in. Um, that's really exciting. And um, man, a lot of pressure here for this talk, uh, high stakes. Um, so my title is From Microbiomes to Roadkill, uh, What Can DNA Tell Us About the Microbiology and Ecology of the Black-Legged Tick? Uh, so that's a mouthful and um, hopefully you'll see, I, I study microbiomes, but more recently I've started studying roadkill and the two are connected. So I'll show you how that works out. Um, you're looking at a picture of the black-legged tick here, which unfortunately is very common in all across Vermont. And also a soil profile, because I actually have um, background in soil ecology, soil chemistry, and soil microbiology. And so I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, and so I also, before we get started, um, you know, science is such a collaborative experience, uh, especially today where we are all so well connected and all the work I'm describing, um, there's so many people who, who made this possible. Lots of students from Green Mountain College. I, I worked there for uh, eight years. I was more recently at the University of Bridgeport uh, for two years. And then I have Northern Vermont University question mark. And hopefully I can fill in this space with um, many of you um, and others who are, um, uh, you know, here at Northern Vermont University. Uh, the, the Vermont Ticksters, uh, David Allen and Alan Giese um, at Middlebury and um, NVU Linden, and then my current collaborators. Let's see here. Just a quick outline. I'll talk about my academic journey, a little bit about microbiomes, or maybe a lot more than you expected. And, um, and then talk about how you can get involved because um, I'm gonna use this as a shameless pitch for some uh, researchers who might wanna um, come and get involved in this work. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and these pictures here are kind of symbolic of my interests. You have soil on the left, ticks in the middle there. And by the way, I don't know if you can know, see this, but um, does anybody know how many ticks you're looking at right here? You can throw it in. The, uh, so I saw um, Lauren put up two. Uh, it was a trick question, I guess. I didn't really mean it to be. Um, there's actually four ticks here. Um, can you see four? Um, my, yeah, four, there's um, two right here. There, uh, can you see where my pointer is circling? And then another one here. It's a male tick and a female tick. This is what, this is, they're mating right now. So you're looking at two mating pairs. And the male tick is, has its mouth parts into um, the uh, female tick. And then on the right here is a Winogradsky column, which um, is showing you, um, this is something we can make in the lab. It's, it's a lot of fun. And these are a lot of different photosynthetic bacteria. So kind of like my symbolizing my interest in microbiology. So my academic journey, um, I started um, that academic journey. I'll start with college. I went to Muhlenberg College, which is in Pennsylvania and I majored in biology. So I am, proudly still using my major. Um, a lot of my friends um, went on to do different things, which was great, but um, it is possible to, uh, uh, to continue to use your major. I minored in philosophy, which was um, really great. Um, 
to kind of complement um, that biological biology studies. I um, one of the more pivotal moments in my life really was uh, I decided in the spring of my junior year to study abroad in Australia. And I was lucky that my parents were really supportive of that. And it was um, a really um, great opportunity. And um, I studied in the rainforests um, in North Queensland, Australia. And that's my first, um, that was when I really first was exposed to ecology. And I've shown some of you in class who might, you know, we saw the cassowary and the strangler fig tree, right? That all comes from Australia. Graduate school, I went to Rutgers. Um, I see there's a, a, Caitlin, do you have your hand up? I see yeah, I have there. a question. Would you prefer them to be asked at the end or like as you go? Uh, we could go as, we can go long as, if, as we go. That's fine. Go ahead. It's probably a stupid question, but I was wondering if they had like ticks in Australia or similar ones to us. Well, that's a great question. There, there are ticks in Australia. Um, uh, I don't know that they have the black-legged tick. I actually haven't given that much thought. Uh, we could look that up really quickly. They, it might be there uh, in very low numbers, but I don't, I don't think so. But yeah, there are ticks all over the planet, different species. Um, the one we have here um, is, uh, uh, and that there are other ticks in parts of the US and in Europe that, and other parts of the world that cause Lyme disease or something similar, but it's not always the same species. That's a great question. I'm going to look that up. I'll look up the, the tick, the common tick species in Australia when we finish here. Um, <clears throat> so in graduate school, I went to Rutgers, which is the State University of New Jersey. And I was um, focusing on soil ecology, soil biogeochemistry and microbial ecology. Um, and I worked in the New Jersey Pine Barrens, which is a big forest in Southern New Jersey. On the right here, um, that's me. Um, uh, the, I constructed these shelters and I had these roofs to uh, block rainfall, and then I could control the amount of rain water that was applied to these plots, and I studied the microbial response. So you can see me there, I've got a hose, and um, it's hooked up to a, a, a battery, and it's drawing water from that, that rain barrel that's buried in the ground, and I just, I'm watering my plots. Um, and I studied um, nitrogen, um, rates of nitrogen cycling with this, um, nutrient analyzer at the bottom here. Um, I also looked at fatty acid profiles to study the microbial community. And I mentioned to some of you the other day in class that, that uh, the phospholipids were my favorite lipid. And that might've been an odd thing to say, um, but that's why I studied phospholipids of soil as a way to study the microbes. Uh, so I did my postdoctoral research, that's postdoc. So after your doctorate, it's this stage uh, before going to become a faculty member uh, that many people take advantage of. And I worked at the University of Maryland in far Western Maryland. And I studied um, soils again using DNA analyses. I, um, in the map on the left, there's a map of all the sites I visited and I collected soil samples and um, compared how the microbes change over, over space. And then I also had another study where I studied how the microbes change in a small plot. This is actually in my advisor's backyard. Uh, and I just sampled this um, over and over again, every season. And then on every day that I sampled, I went out like every four hours and, and sampled how the microbes uh, change over the course of one day. So that's the kind of thing I was working on there. Then I became a faculty member and I've, um, this is my third institution. I, I started off at Green Mountain College and I'm sure many of you have heard of Green Mountain College. Unfortunately, we closed in 2019. Um, and I still live in Poultney, which is where Green Mountain College is located. The campus is still there. It looks still being used and you, you should come down and hope you can visit it if you like. Uh, then I moved to the University of Bridgeport after the closure and I was there for two years. This photo is actually from my last day. I was moving out and took one last photo with a couple of my students and then I was off. And um, I think I um, highlighted, sorry, this, um, I got a few things blocking my screen here. Yeah, so I'm circling my office at Green Mountain College right out front and then pointing to where my office was at the University of Bridgeport, just for, just for fun. And here I am, right, at uh, Northern Vermont University and we're already, there's my lab, well, well, here it is back here and 
we're already getting started. We officially uh, started lab research yesterday. So that's a little bit about my, uh, that, so Caitlin, is, that, is your hand up again or is that from the, the previous time? I'm not sure. Oh, is it still up? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, okay, I wanted to make sure. And actually I can't really see anyone else's hand. Caitlin, oh, I guess if you, if you raise your hand, you'll come closer to where I can see you. All right. So let's talk about um, microbiomes because that's a lot of what my research is about. And this might be a good time to um, open up the chat or you could shout it out or in the chat, why are microbiomes so important? I'd like to hear um, what, what you've been hearing about microbiomes, why you think they're important, um, that kind of thing. And I see, um, I'm not sure how to read your name there, but you've got your hand up. So go ahead. Pac, P-A-C-I-S, Pacis Jovia. Is that your last name? Hello, yeah, no, my first name is Pacis. Okay. Um, I believe scientists study microbes to understand the fundamentals of how everything begins and re how everything uh, like the origins of life. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's a great one. I've got a um, actually. Let me just show you right now. Um, here is a phylogenetic tree of all life as we know it. Right, and every organism on Earth fits into one of these branches. And the belief is that the thinking is that somewhere around here in the middle, there was some ancestral organism that from which everything else evolved. Um, yeah, and so that's one of my favorite topics. I love. Um, I once taught a class on the origins of life, um, and you know how that first organism came into being. Uh, Randall. Uh, well, I was thinking, you know, studying microbes in the soil might give you a better, also give you an idea of the health of the of the, the biosphere in general. Oh, definitely, yeah. And um, so, if there's something, some pollution going on, that could affect the microbes. So, it could be a good indicator of of soil health or planetary health, right? Yeah, great. Uh, let's see who else. Uh, Caitlin. Um, I think they're really important because all there's millions of them, and I know they're helpful to our health. And they work in our. I'm pretty sure that yeah, they work in your stomach to digest your food and do a bunch of processes in your body. I'm pretty sure we can make food with them. That's right. Or that they'll, they'll process our um, food into needed nutrients and all kinds of metabolites that are beneficial. Some could could be harmful as well, but uh, de uh, definitely they're, they, could, they could help or hinder our health, absolutely. Uh, yeah, Pacus, go ahead, and then Randall. And feel free for the rest, everyone else, if you, you could just throw something in the chat. Go ahead, Pacus. I'm sorry, I guess I didn't unraise my hand. Oh, oh. I got you. And Randall, is that the same thing? Okay, see in the chat. I was gonna say, they probably do what I Uh, so Rachel, the immune system, right? There's a connection there. Um, exact, definitely. What else? You all want to, well, how about I tell you? That's a good list. Um, and before I go into microbiomes in more detail, uh, you've already, I'm really amazed. It's like, you did you see my, were you watching me make my talk? Because you've all hit on a lot of the points I was gonna make, but there are a few others. But before I get into that, let me set the stage for microbiome research and talk about this great plate count anomaly. Um, so there was a time when it was really hard to um, study microbes. Um, we, would, we could use microscopes and we could grow them in a lab. But the problem is that um, when you try to grow microbes on a dish, which you see on the right here, you take, take some environmental sample and grow them on a dish and you might get one colony and one colony represents one species, just many, many individuals of the same species. And, um, but if you look at that same sample under the microscope, you see all kinds of different microbes. You can tell they're different based on their, their shape and their size and their locomotion or lack thereof, how they move around. 
So this is a paradox. We, we can see so many into the microscope, but we can't really grow them. So there's probably far more microbes than we realize. And that, that is in fact the case. We, the, there are estimates that we can only grow about 1% of all microbes. And that might be, it might be more or less than 1%, but it gives you the idea that there's a lot out there we don't know about. And so we can use, um, today we can use DNA sequencing which is a culture independent technique. We don't need to culture in order, which allows us to study microbes by looking at the DNA that we find. So at least, you know, we can't see them under the microscope. We can't grow them, but we, we know they're there from their DNA. And so, as I mentioned, um, we have this phylogenetic tree and most organisms on earth are microbial. So if you think about from a biological perspective, this is incredibly important. We are unable to grow the vast majority of what is most abundant on our planet in terms of living, of, in terms of life. And, um, and most of this life is microbial. So what I'm circling there are the bacteria and the archaea, which have similar kind of cell types, a huge amount of bacterial diversity. In fact, right here on the right, this purplish area, these are all very new to science and they're all bacteria but yet quite distinct from these over here. So they share similar DNA. Um, some aspects of their DNA are similar, the, the DNA that we use to make this tree, but they're probably very different in many ways as well. Down here, we have the eukaryotes. Now we as humans are eukaryotes, so we're plants, animals, fungi, but most of the um, organisms in that eukaryotic branch are also microbial, protists, algae, um, things like that. And by the way, so the the, the, the the, the, how close or how far away these different branches are tells you something about how similar or distantly related they are. So it's a, it's a phylogenetic tree. So we are closely related to eukaryotes. We're actually more closely related to the archaea than we are to the bacteria, but we're still quite distinct from the archaea. And I see in the, in the chat, can you make alcohol? Um, yeah, by uh, the, um, uh, some microbes will um, yeast and others will have alcohol as a byproduct. That's from the chat. Um, and microbes break down compost to be used for gardening or agriculture. Absolutely. So if you have a compost pile, it's kind of like your soil accelerated, right? And they are breaking down all that food and organic matter. And so what's a microbiome? Um, does anybody, um, well, I think you all have an idea. I'll, I'll just walk you through. Um, kind of the origin of this word here, um, a biome. And this is great for my ecology students because we'll talk about this soon. It's a major habitat type on earth, right? And so we have tropical rainforests as a biome, uh, temperate forests that we have here in Vermont. That's a, another biome. They're, they're, they're characterized by their dominant um, vegetation. Um, and so a microbiome happens at a much smaller scale. There's, there's just, you can think of any habitat you, uh, you can imagine, and there are lots of microbes present, lots of diversity, and it's kind of like all of these different biomes, but at, at this very small scale, right? And sometimes the diversity is even greater than what you would see in an entire terrestrial biome, right? So what? So here, a few more. I asked, you know, why are micro why are microbiomes important? Um, you hit on a lot of major ones. As you know, they're in our guts. Um, um, and they can be used as a, a warning sign of um, cancers, such as colorectal cancer. Um, and um, your, your gut uh, kit has a microbiome that could be um, a healthy or not healthy. And, and a lot of that depends on um, what your gut is exposed to, what foods, environmental exposures, et cetera. I, this is a fascinating one. Um, the oral microbiome, the microbiome of your, of your oral cavity um, can actually influence the outcome of pregnancy. And it's a, it's a complex um, interaction, but those microbes, um, especially when, when there's a dis, uh, an imbalance, like a periodontal infection, um, this, can, this can interact with, um, with uh, developing fetus and, and, and um, have negative outcomes on, on uh, pregnancy. Um, is that why people that are pregnant can have their teeth rot? Well, I, I don't, so someone asked what I'm talking about here, can, can um, 
pregnancy lead to tooth rot? I don't know the answer to that. All I can tell you is that um, periodontitis, if someone is pregnant and has a, this periodontal infection, that can then um, affect the pregnancy. Um, it's also true, um, it seems to be true that the pregnancy itself can, in, can alter the oral microbiome. So there's an interaction there. And, and so I'm not familiar with that specific example, but um, it's, it seems like it might be part of this um, general topic. Uh, yeah, I see jo Jonah, is it is your hand up? Jonah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, <laughs> my grandmother had six kids and she lost her teeth. And the reason I guess is because the babies, um, because she had them in such a short period of time, the babies um, took all of her calcium out of her, her, her body. Mm. Wow. Well, that's, that's really unfortunate, but, and um, I'm, thanks for sharing that. And I'm, I'm, the positive is that I learned something. I think that might be a little bit different from what we're talking about here, but I will admit that I'm getting a little bit outside my area of expertise, but, um, but this is great, great areas of discussion. So there's a, this study um, came out a while ago and, um, Noah Fierre and Rob Knight found that um, we're leaving a, a microbial signature on our keyboards. We are inoculating our keyboards with our, the fingers on our microbes. If you, if you look at the microbes on your fingertips and the microbes on your keyboard, as long, if you're the only person using that keyboard, you're gonna find that they're very similar and distinct from the fingertips and keyboards of some other person. So we have this hand microbiome and we're, our hand is picking up microbes from whatever we touch, right? And we are also depositing microbes. And this is not necessarily something to be concerned about. Of course, hygiene is important. We have a global pandemic and we're worried about uh, keeping uh, clean because we have this virus circulating around. But um, for aside from those obvious problems, um, you know, this is just part of our experience, right, throughout life. There's this interesting shower head microbiome project where um, it's a citizen science project. And you, if you were in this study, you could get a kit and swab your shower head and mail it back to the, to the research group and they'll sequence it and tell you what's in your shower head. And sometimes um, it's, it's nothing to be concerned about. There could sometimes be some pathogens of concern. Um, I clicked on, so you can click on this interactive map and this is what came up for, there's a site in Vermont um, and you can see um, some microbes that might be on your shower head. I hope I'm not turning anyone off from taking a shower. <laughs> Soil microbiomes, right? This is something I do. And um, I really just, um, there's a lot going on in this picture. Um, we can have a whole discussion on this. Um, I guess for now, we, I would point out that on the ground there, those tree-like structures coming out of the ground, those are fungi and um, are represent the rich diversity of fungi in soils and, and how trees are wired up to one another through these soil fungi and lots of mutualisms going on there. We'll talk about this in ecology um, in a few weeks. Great image by um, Alan Rayner, who's a, who's a mycologist. Um, microbiomes can influ influence rates of pathogen transmission by mosquitoes. Okay, so there's a mosquito microbiome that could influence their ability um, to um, transmit pathogens. Uh, same with the tick microbiome. And this is what I study. Um, I study tick microbiomes. And on the left there, you're looking at some representative species that are in Ixodi scapularis. That's the black-legged tick that we have here in Vermont. And there's a, a picture of one. Um, and this microbiome is um, uh, believed to be helping the Lyme disease pathogen to colonize ticks. So a tick takes a blood meal, and depending on the composition of the microbiome, that tick may be more or less likely to pick up Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the Lyme disease pathogen. This is an area of active research that myself and others are working on. And um, any questions before I get, I'm gonna get into a little bit more, we're gonna shift gears and um, get a little more into the science. Um, any questions or comments before I do that? Um, really psyched by all the questions. I'm, this is, I'm not used to this. You're a, a participatory group. That's awesome. So Randall and then uh, Jana. Um, I was just going to ask, I mean, I, obviously this, I mean, I, I imagine this work isn't really life-threatening, but is there any amount of personal risk in any of this research that you do? 
Like, well, are you taking the risk of getting Lyme disease or something? Yes, uh, there is definitely risk. Um, the, the risky part is not in the lab because by the time the ticks are in the lab, they are dead. And, um, and, and there's, there's no chance for that Borrelia to, to um, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's sort of a, a process that the pathogen goes through before it becomes infectious. Um, and it involves uh, the tick taking a blood meal. So if a tick is carrying Borrelia, that the, the pathogen, the Borrelia pathogen becomes more infectious as that blood meal is consumed and there are physiological changes. And so that couldn't happen because the tick and the Borrelia are, are both dead. In the field, I, I collect ticks and that is a risk, right? Because anytime we go into the woods in Vermont, uh, we, uh, especially during June and November, those are peak times, but other times of year, ticks are at all times of year, you have a risk of getting a tick bite. The one benefit I would say of, of um, collecting ticks is that when I go out into the field and collect ticks, I'm super aware of the risk, right? So I, um, I wear a one piece suit, partly for research and, and it also helps to um, get the ticks off of me. And then when I finish collecting, I come home, I throw all of my clothes in the dryer for at least 10 minutes. I take a shower and I do a tick check and twice a day um, for the entire field season. And this is good, good to do for most of the year, twice a day, do a tick check. And if at all possible, have uh, a, someone, uh, a partner or someone to uh, check your back where you can't see. So, so far, so good. Um, the, the, uh, the interesting thing is that um, sometimes when people um, stop collecting, they're not doing their research, but they're just out for a hike or they're camping. I've heard stories where that's where they then get Lyme disease because they let their guard down, right? So if you were to go into the field and um, take soil samples, right? That's the same risk that I'd have, except you might not be thinking about ticks, whereas I am. You see what I mean? So it's definitely a risk, but in some ways I feel a little bit safer. So it's a great question, but um, for it's really, uh, the more we can think about ticks, the better off we'll be. Um, any other, uh, Jana, you had a question? No, I tried to lower my hand. I don't know why it's still okay. up. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. So we're, I'm just getting used to the, uh, we're all getting used to Zoom again, right? We'll, we'll be experts. Hopefully we will not be experts anytime soon. We'll go, uh, this is good. I like it this way where we forgot how to use it. Um, so I study Exodia scapularis, the black-legged tick, and you're looking here at the different life stages. The larvae have six legs, the nymphs and the adults have eight, and the, the adults of course are bigger. The, fe the scutum here on the females, that's coming down about a third of the way, and the males, the scutum comes all the way down. Tick, TickEncounter.org, by the way, is a great, um, a great resource for learning about ticks. So um, ticks are blood-sucking parasites and um, they exchange Borrelia burgdorferi between themselves and, and their hosts. Um, so imagine you have an infected tick here, those red squiggly lines, those are the spirochetes. And they take a um, blood meal. During the blood meal, those um, spirochetes multiply and that causes a physiological change in the tick. The, 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 path, the spirochetes then migrate to the um, salivary glands and then into a host. And so then this mouse here that was, it was feeding upon is now infected with Borrelia burgdorferi. Then um, a few days or weeks later, other ticks might be feeding on that mouse. Uh, these are not trying to scale, by the way. These ticks are, these would be giant, <laughs> scary ticks. Ticks are much smaller. And then those ticks um, can get the infection from that mouse. And the white-footed mouse, um, which is what you're looking at here, that is the, the best host for Borrelia burgdorferi. Why is that? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> ooh, where do we begin? Um, there's, it has to do with their, um, their uh, they can't get the ticks off of them for one. Um, their immune system is, is not effective at fighting the infection. And um, they are um, in the same environment as ticks here in Vermont, especially disturbed sites. So it's kind of a mixture of um, uh, the, the, their 
immunology, their, their life history, a lot of factors. Now deer, on the other hand, are also hosts for ticks, but they don't transfer um, Borrelia to ticks as frequently. And that is because deer um, have their, um, uh, parts of their immune system can clear the infection. Um, there's a lizard out in uh, Western, out in California that um, is a host for Ixodes pacificus, which is a different tick that also can carry Borrelia burgdorferi. And that lizard um, can actually, if, it's, if the tick is infected, the lizard will actually clear the infection from the tick. So animals have different ranges of tolerance for ticks um, in terms of their ability to, to pick them off. Like humans, we're really good at picking ticks off, right? They might harm us tremendously. Um, but um, I got a mess, sorry, I had a distracting message on my screen. Um, but we're good at um, picking them off. Uh, question about moose. Um, now the, the, the ticks that are on the moose here in Vermont are uh, a different species. Uh, the winter tick, the genus is Dermacenter. And um, that's a, it's a huge problem. Uh, and the ticks are killing moose by taking so much of their blood. Uh, the tick, many ticks are able to feed on a moose and they lose a lot of blood, they lose their hair and they, um, are less able to survive winters. Uh, the black-legged tick will feed on deer, but they don't, uh, a deer cannot host as many ticks as a moose can. And so deer can survive. You, you'll see lots of ticks on, on the ears and um, under the armpits on a, on a deer, but they don't die um, as a result. Uh, yeah, Elizabeth, you have a question. You're muted though. Hi. Um, okay. Yes. Um, so I was wondering, I saw your statistic of the Lyme disease cases. Are those permanent um, or are they like temporary? Like some people get like bit by a tick, but then they get prescribed medication and then they're okay. So are those like permanent or are those like treatable cases? Sorry, no. This includes every reported yeah. case, regardless of the severity. Okay, so this includes my, in, in fact, this is an estimate because um, the actual number of cases that's recorded in some way, either a positive test or a doctor makes the diagnosis is one-tenth of these numbers, roughly. Um, these are um, kind of estimates of what the actual number is. So when we say, um, and they're, they're using, um, in the 2010 to 2018, I believe they're using um, health insurance data. Um, so there could be a connection there to diagnoses. Um, but um, the number that's reported to the CDC is actually less than this. I think we're seeing something similar with COVID. Uh, unfortunately, I think that the, um, and we all know that, right? So if, if someone has a case and they, they don't even realize it, right? And then it's never reported. So. Similarly, the actual number of COVID cases is probably much higher than, than what we're seeing. Um, <laughs> do ticks pollinate or do anything beneficial? Nope, not that I know of. Uh, there's no, no evidence that they, they certainly don't pollinate and they're, they're not really um, feeding um, on plants. They, they could like crawl around a plant. Um, I mean, I suppose they could spread things around a little bit, but that's not really what they do. And what, do they have any benefit this is a question I get asked a lot and what, what's their purpose or what's their benefit? Um, and the answer I give is not satisfying, but their, their purpose from an ecological perspective is that they are parasites. <laughs> um, and it's um, their niche is parasitism and um, they can do it so they exist. <laughs> That's sort of my ecological slash philosophical answer there. <laughs> Waste wastes of space. Um, yeah, I mean they're um, <laughs> they're 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 not. It, it's it's a really good question. Um, are there benefits? Um, I'll, have to, I'll have to try to think about that one some more. Other other pathogens that um, the ticks are carrying. Um, there's anaplasma, phagocytophilum, which causes anaplasmosis, which is quite common. Uh, in, it's the second most common tick-borne disease, um, certainly in Vermont. Borrelia miyamatoi, it's a little more less common. Babesia microti, 
very rare, but um, has a malaria type illness, Powassan virus. And then there's the tick microbiome, which is just all the microbes living in the tick, right? The bacteria, fun, the fungi are on the surface and the archaea, not too many archaea, uh, maybe none. And, the, um, and the, there are eukaryotic microbes as well. The um, Babesia, by the way, is a eukaryote, okay? Uh, I'm not going to go over the life cycle, but just you could you, just to show that um, you know the nymphs are out more active in the spring. Coming up in November, we're we're going to see the adults, and the larvae are larvae are out now and probably waning down. Okay, and so what can we learn from DNA analysis of ticks, which is what I do? Um, so we can look for novel and emerging pathogens. Um, I've given you a list of what's present in ticks. Is that a complete list? Maybe not because we have to know how to look for it, right? And there are different microbes in ticks that we might not be looking for. And that's a very strong possibility that there's yet more stuff in there that we don't know about. Um, and we can search for microbes that might harm ticks. Uh, fungi are actually predators of ticks. And so there are fungi that grow on ticks and some might reduce their fitness. That is their ability to reproduce. And we can look for those and maybe use them in some kind of control strategy. We can look for microbes that might be um, blocking Borrelia transmission. And there are some possibilities out there um, that um, some researchers, I, I've, I've worked on this and I have some ideas and, and there are other groups that are doing really great work on this as well. And so that might help us to understand how to block because it's really not the ticks that are making us sick, right? It's the pathogens they carry. Um, and we wanna, we wanna target those pathogens. I have a question. We, oh, sure. This is pro might be far out there, but I was wondering if there was a way, like, you know, like crisp, there's CRISPR, could you somehow like edit the gene on a tick so they couldn't pick up the virus and then like spread it to a bunch of ticks? Well, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting idea. Um, you know, your, your question falls into that broader category of can we genetically engineer ticks to, to solve this problem? And the answer is probably yes, that's a possibility. Certainly with mosquitoes, there um, are projects and they're quite controversial. Um, genetically engineered mosquitoes are being released into certain habitats to try to um, allow that new form to spread and um, become more dominant. And then you have this dominant strain of mosquito that, that is not transmitting disease. Um, then there are, that's a um, possibility. And then there's some, some ethical or ecological considerations around that. Um, there are people, uh, I'll show you an image later about how we might be able to control ticks. Uh, and there are, there are ways to um, trap mice and treat them with an anti-tick medicine or even an anti-microbial anti treatment to clear their infection. So there, there are strategies like that as well. It's a good question. And ultimately all this research we're doing, um, we, we um, are gonna wanna try to apply it to, to somehow solve this problem. It could be land management is another way we can um, uh, buy, um, how we manage our forests actually can impact tick density. That would be a, a great topic for another time. It might be too much for today though. Um, oh, and so this last point here, determine what host species are used by ticks. So this is a little bit of a mystery. We know that ticks are generalists and they can feed on lots of different things, lots of different animals, um, almost any mammal, lots of birds, anything with a backbone really. The question is what are they actually which animals out in Vermont and in the United States and the world are ticks feeding on in a way that is boosting their population size and increasing their rate of infection with Borrelia burgdorferi? And we have limited information about host use. And um, this is actually something I'm just starting to work on right now. I have a project that really is beginning right now where we, we can look at, and I'll tell you more about it in a second. Um, so my overall approach to this DNA analysis, um, this is going to be great for my um, cell bio students and anyone who might take cell bio or genetics to learn a little bit more about how this work is done. And for all of you, hopefully, you'll find it interesting. Um, so we can take some environmental sample. For me, it's going to be soil or tick. 
and we can extract the DNA, right? We just did that uh, yesterday here in cell bio in this lab. We, we um, extracted DNA from ticks. And then we can amplify a gene of interest through a process known as polymerase chain reaction. Um, and then we can use DNA sequencing to see if that, what if we got that gene and what, um, what that gene looks like. And we do that on a sequencing machine. Um, and I will just briefly mention um, the, the gene amplification. Um, we take, um, let's say there's this blue strange stuff is just all the DNA in our sample. But this red part is the gene we really wanna know. We wanna know if it's in our sample and if so, what, what is the makeup of that gene? So we use a procedure where we can make many, many copies of just that gene. And we do that through polymerase chain reaction and it relies on primers, which are these little short sections of DNA that will bind to certain regions of the environmental sample. So if our gene of interest is present, this, these primers will find it, amplify it, and then we can study it. So that's, that's PCR in a nutshell. And we can sequence on, uh, this is the NovaSeq 6000. Uh, if you really want in a single run, you could get like 50 billion DNA sequences. <laughs> uh, and so if you were, depending on what you were studying, if you had a lot of samples and you were maybe studying the gut microbiome of the human, you might need to, to capture all of that diversity. Or you can do this for uh, genome sequencing. You wanna study the human genome. Uh, you could use a machine like this to do that. All, this, all the DNA in an individual or, or several individuals. So what does the data look like? Um, I thought I would just show you uh, what we're up against here. I'm gonna show you a small data set, only a million sequences. So let me stop sharing my screen and I'm going to um, share, first I'm gonna share this screen here. And each of these files is a different sample. In this case, it doesn't really matter what the samples are. So we have 10 samples here, okay? And if we open up one of those samples, it looks like this. And um, the top row here is information about the specific DNA sequence. The second row is the actual DNA sequence, A, T, G, C, right? It's a genetic code. Then you have this plus sign for some reason, it's just the format of the file. And then you have these letters and characters. These tell you about the quality of your sequences. So my first DNA nucleotide is a C and A is a measure of how confident we are that that's really a C. And A turns out to be like, we're very confident. Some of these other codes mean that eh, it's not a good quality. Lots of, you know, that's beyond the scope of this talk, but you have, the actual sequence, you have quality information. And so four of these rows is for one DNA sequence. But if I scroll down here, I'm not sure how well this is looking for you. Can you see that I'm scrolling, um, right? And we get to the bottom, there are like 200,000 rows, well, four rows per sequence. So there are 50,000 DNA sequences in this one sample. And that's a small data set. And remember I showed you for this project, I had 10 of these, but other projects, I might have a hundred samples and I might have a hundred thousand sequences per sample or a million sequences per sample. So how on earth do you analyze all this data, right? You can't read it, right? You, no, one's, no one's looking. That's about as much time as we wanna spend actually looking at the DNA. Um, but what we can do here, I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint. Uh, let's see here. We can, there's a lot of things we can do. This is one example. We can make what's called a distance matrix. So we use um, bioinformatics software and statistical programs, right? For us, this is just magic right now, but I'll teach you more about it if you like. We can, we can, we can learn in depth how this is working and you can do your own bioinformatics. Um, and we get a number for every tick. And we, but the number is in comparison to another tick. So if we look at um, tick number two and tick number one, where they intersect, it says 0.63. 
It's a measure of how similar those microbial communities are. And then we can go to um, tick, oh, I don't know, tick three and tick two. And it's this number, 0.59. So tick one and two are more similar to one another in terms of their microbiome than ticks two and three. Is everyone with me there? I can't see your faces right now because of the screen. I'm hoping you're all nodding yes, or maybe you've just like totally uh, zoned out, which um, all these numbers are, have that tiring effect, I, I know. But so anyway, a bigger so, number is better? Well, better in terms of um, they're more similar. It's not better or worse. It just means they're more similar to one another. Lower number. The two ticks have different, more different microbiomes. So it's like a community profile. It's a community signature. It doesn't tell us what species are here, but it's a signature. Now, even this is too much, right? Because um, what, is, what are you going to make? And by the way, along the diagonal, there's zeros. That's because tick one um, is totally similar to tick one, right? You're just comparing the same thing. That, that's obvious. But then what you do is you can use um, some kind of multivariate technique to visualize this. So, and this right here is a principal coordinates analysis, which is not necessarily the best way to analyze this data, but I think it's one that um, is good just to show you, give you a sense of what, what, how I do the work. Um, like a statistician might take issue with this. That's why I'm making that uh, caveat. Um, and what you're looking at here is that every dot here represents the microbiome of a different tick. So if two dots are close together, that means their microbiome is more similar. If two dots are further away, they're more different. So along this first axis, the first principal coordinate, we see there's a spread between the red and the blue. And what are those red and blue dots? Well, the blue are ticks that took their blood meal from an opossum, and the red are ticks that took their blood meal from a squirrel. So what this is showing us is that it appears that ticks can have a different microbiome based on the animal from which they took their blood meal. And this is something I've worked on a little bit in the past. The data is actually a lot messier than this. I will want to just be clear. I am handpicking something that's just easy to visualize, but we should look at the paper to get all the details. And um, it's, it's, uh, this is, looks very, this is a really good difference for ecological data. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to make it easy for you to all see what's going on here as easy as possible, but the reality is messier, but there is this I, indication that hosts do, uh, ticks have different microbiomes based on the host from which they take their blood meal. How are we doing? Okay, that's, wow, we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna um, speed it up a little bit here. Oh, I see there's a question in the chat. Okay, no, oh, that's an old one. Um, so we can classify these DNA sequences as well by searching against a database. And so in this sample, this is from my ticks from, from Rutland County, Vermont. I found anaplasma, which is, causes anaplasmosis. Um, Borrelia is right there. Rickettsia in blue, that's a really abundant microbe in ticks and they are a, a nutritional endosymbiont. They are providing, they're, it's believed that they're providing the tick with um, B vitamins, which they don't get from their blood meal. And then there's other microbes we, can, we don't have to worry about right now. Now this host, um, a host DNA um, is interesting, can we, can we figure out what a tick has been eating by the DNA that's left over from its blood meal? And so a tick takes a blood meal from a mouse, let's say, um, it gets a lot of host DNA, and um, then it becomes engorged, and then it molts into the adult stage, and that adult stage has DNA left over from its blood meal from the animal that it fed from. And so I did my, I used my microbiome technique to look for host DNA, and I found, um, in this small data set that all the ticks I looked at were feeding on um, white-tailed deer, um, Ovirginianus, okay? And we can, don't worry about the rest of the details in this table, just that my data is showing that at this particular site, which did happen to have a lot of deer, there was evidence that all of these ticks um, were feeding on white-tailed deer, which is very surprising because th these are adults I studied, their last blood meal was as a nymph, that's a juvenile stage. We all know that adults feed on ticks, but what's less appreciated is the extent to which nymphs and larvae are feeding on deer. So this was surprising. And it's something that we wanted to confirm. So this is where we go from microbiomes to roadkill because I wanted to find direct visual evidence to support um, this, this finding. 
And so um, we took advantage of roadkill uh, that unfortunately uh, deer get hit by cars, and um, but we can at least use this to study deer. The only time you can get a, 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 a dead deer is during hunting season usually, but um, we can also study deer when, um, when there is a roadkill and that's at other times of year. So, so during hunting season, the adults are feeding on deer and nothing else, not the other stages, but in July and June and May, you might see nymphs and larvae. And that's what we were trying to figure out. So we um, got a, a lot of roadkill and um, we had, and we looked at, inspected them and found um, nymphs um, feeding on the deer. So this is direct evidence that this nymphal life stage will take a blood meal from deer. And so I'm not the first to find this, but um, this is indicating to my molecular data and this visual evidence, this is much more common than we, than we realized. More work needs to be done, however. Um, and the next thing we did is we took deer hides and we hung them over um, a pool of water. And um, so the, the, the larvae are really hard to find. And if there are larvae on this deer, they're gonna fall off into the pool of water and then I can search the pool of water. Um, and this work um, is done by um, Abby Serra, who's actually a graduate of Linden State College and Abby works for Fish and Wildlife but also worked with Alan Giese at Linden State College, now NVU Linden, on, on ticks. And so she was excited to get involved in this research. So she's providing me as a, someone from Fish and Wildlife, she's responsible for getting the roadkill and can um, skin, the, skin the deer and bring it to me. But she also uses the meat from these roadkills for food banks. So as sad as it is that this deer is getting killed, uh, it's being used um, in food banks and for scientific research. Um, and we're not trying, we're not intentionally trying to harm a deer, but unfortunately this happens. Um, I see some questions, I'll get to those in a second. And so when we did this, we found 36 larvae. Okay, further supporting this idea that, that these juvenile stages feed on deer, um, which was, we first got from molecular data. Um, so let me see, I got um, in the chat here, um, are they good for the environment? If you make them, I will come back to these later. Yeah, Caitlin, did you have a question? Yes, I have yet another question, sorry. Um, how do you make sure, like, is there a way to make sure the uh, rope kilt is fresh and hasn't been sitting there for a while? Because I imagine if it's been sitting there for days, you don't want to give that to someone to eat. Oh, oh yeah, no, we, we are only using fresh rope kill. Um, and, and for the, the research, it needs to be fresh because after a certain amount of time, the, the ticks that are in, attached will, will detach and move off. So if it's, if it's been more than a few hours, we don't use it. And certainly for the uh, food shelters, um, you know, it's um, fresh. How can you tell how long it's been that it's been there? Um, that's a, uh, uh, sometimes the deer need to be put down. Uh, they're, they're not, dead yet, right? They're, but they have to be put down so then you know. Um, you can also, um, uh, there are um, ways from, I think the, uh, I, I, you know, Abby, Abby has explained this to me and um, I'm not gonna answer it because I'm, I'm probably gonna give the wrong answer, but there are ways to know. Um, I'll, I'll, I can get, I can check with her and get back to you. Uh, but certainly um, if it has to be put down, we definitely know the time of death, right? But that's a really good point, and it is something that's considered. Um, so we use the protocol. Um, I'm going to um, skip that and just mention that you can get involved if you're interested in tick collecting. This is we we drag a cloth around the forest floor, and um, this is how we estimate population size in the lab. We do. Um, a great student um, way for students to get involved is through um, doing the DNA extractions um, and um, PCR. We can we can do pathogen detection. Um, there's my PCR machine. It's still in the box. You see that box there? That's my QPCR machine. I haven't set it up yet. <laughs> um, and I have um, the Roadkill project is ongoing. We're trying to expand that. Um, there's ways to do bioinformatics if you like computer programming and statistics, uh, GIS analysis. Um, these are all ways that um, there are projects that, that, that there are opportunities. So I hope you'll, um, 
if you're interested in this kind of work, let, you know, let me know and uh, we can talk. Um, and my last slide here, if you're interested in soil, let's chat. I actually, my training uh, is in soil ecology and soil biogeochemistry. Um, I've got a lot of interest and background in soils. And so that's like a whole other talk, but I just wanted to mention that, that I have this other um, line of, of, of research that I do. And I, I'd say I'm time for questions, but you've been all great about asking questions throughout. Um, and, but, you know, if there are more questions, um, I'd be happy to, um, or just discussion, be happy to do that now. Um, I have a question. Is there, is there a known cause, I mean, a known cure for, for Lyme? Or is it just like something that affects you? Like I didn't fully get that. Um, is there a cause for, what's the cause of Lyme disease? Is there a cure for Lyme disease? Oh, cure, oh, cure. Um, no, there's um, the normal, and I, I should preface this by saying that I am not a medical doctor. The doctor in front of my name is purely, it's a, it's a, a doctor, one of my, um, well, that's a, a separate story. I'm not a medical doctor. And um, I just know as a, uh, a person who has a tick bites that um, the, the first thing that often is prescribed is doxycycline, it's antibiotic, but not always. Um, and that um, I just know from my friends who have had Lyme disease that that is often effective, but not always. And then of course we have um, sometimes there are these long-term problems that uh, are, are really complex and, and difficult to figure out. But um, the best, as far as I know, is the antibiotic route, which often, but not always, helps a lot. Um, there was one in the chat, and I saw that, and I think I forgot. Um, do you know why fruit flies are used in testing food additives to see how they may affect human gut microbiomes? I'm, I'm fortunately, I'm not familiar with that. I'd have to reach a look at that a little bit later. Uh, do their biomes have similar microbes? Uh, and I thought mice are used for their nest by ticks and their life cycle and for keeping them warm in the winter. Well, okay, so the similarity of microbiomes, you might have to help me out, I wasn't quite sure. Um, usually different organisms have distinct microbiomes. Even individual individuals of the same species can have different microbiomes, although usually it's more similar to, than to microbiomes of other species. The ticks in the, in the winter, um, they overwinter by, by um, burrowing into the soil. And there's a lot of mortality. So ticks will die in a, in a cold winter, but not 100%, right? And so um, uh, even though there is mortality due to the cold, they don't all die. And um, <clears throat> winter, it's, it's kind of an interesting, um, a snowpack can actually raise the temperature of soil. And so if you have a, a cold and snowy winter, that could potentially um, be beneficial for ticks, right? Because of that snowpack. Um, those dynamics, people look at that and, um, you know, winter temperatures and snowfall, and it's, a, it's really complex to study. Um, I think what's uh, a, another consideration for tick mortality is um, humidity. Ticks do not like dry conditions. That's why if you put your clothes in the dryer, that will kill ticks. If you put your ticks, if you put your clothes in the washing machine and there are ticks on your clothes, they might not die. They can survive that. You want to put them in the dryer. Um, so I would recommend dry your clothes first and then the wash. And so those uh, hot, if you have a lot of hot and dry weather, that's probably going to be really harmful to ticks as well. Or they just won't come out. They'll just stay, stay put. Less, there is less um, tick illness. Uh, correct. You don't see many cases in Arizona. Um, strangely enough, though, someone just recently um, was looking for ticks on a beach in California, and they found them in the shrubs. Um, probably not in the sand. I would be surprised because that's going to be hot and dry, but but still near the beach, right? Oh. Um, sometimes if you see a case of Lyme disease um, in a state like that, it could just be... Um, you know, the states where you might see like just a handful of cases they might have actually acquired it somewhere else in the country. So if I was going to go um, outside, where would it, I find like the highest probability of finding ticks would be 
because I wanted to find them. Yep. Well, that uh, if you're well. Uh, by the way, thanks for um, asking that question because I'm going to throw that. I'll answer that, but first I want to throw it back to the class and ask all of you if you know where there are ticks in Johnson, Vermont, on or near campus. I really need to know that because um, we are going to do a tick lab, and I'm going to um, ask my students to go um, voluntarily um, go out and look for ticks. So we need some good sites. Um, the second part of that question, Lauren, is that um, for our tick lab. We are going to actually do what you're asking. We're going to try to predict using um, a GIS model. We, by the way, we have an incredible GIS professor here at uh, NVU. I, I can't believe it's someone who's actually involved in developing the ARC map software. So um, if you want to take GIS, even if you don't want to take it, take it because you'll, this is an amazing opportunity. I'm just blown away. And I, um, so I'm getting you. So let me go back to your question. Um, so we can use GIS and this um, great expert that we have and our knowledge of habitat conditions, and we can predict where the ticks are going to be. And then during our class, we're going to actually look for, see if our, if we, how our predictions turned out. Now, to really answer your question, the black legged tick that causes Lyme disease, usually in a forest, if you're in the, on the lawn or something, uh, I mean, I suppose it's possible, but it's less likely. In a forest, uh, I would say if there's a body of water, like you got a stream, uh, they don't, they're not gonna be in the stream, but near it where it's gonna be more humid. They like that moisture. Just uh, So those two, um, elevation, they tend to be found at lower elevation. Those three, um, and if you all from ecology remember that, you can um, remember and you can, spit that back to me when we get to this GIS lab, because those are the three that I'm going to be pushing. A disturbed site. So when we have disturbance, um, if there's a, um, a, a clear cut and um, let's say a, a forest has been cut down, but maybe a patch of woods still remains where the ticks can survive, that's, a, that's an area where you might find a lot of ticks because um, the, their host, the white-footed mouse, is really effective at colonizing those patches quickly. And so you might uh, and we do tend to see them in disturbed sites and sites with deer, right? Anywhere you see deer, um, you're likely to see a lot of ticks. And if, and if you see a lot of, do you have any Japanese barberry up here or honeysuckle? Anybody? Those are um, invasive species. They're probably further south. We've got it a little bit in Southern Vermont, certainly in New Jersey, Connecticut. Those are associated with um, high, uh, uh, tick densities. There's something about that habitat they like. And those plants are also correlated with deer abundance because when deer are present, they tend to facilitate the, the growth of these invasives. Yeah, Caitlin, did you have another question? Oh, and thanks, Rachel. So we do have- Yes, um, I was wondering. Go ahead. I think you're muted, Caitlin. Oh, okay. Um, sorry. I was wondering if it would kind of be beneficial in a way, glo global warming, since ticks don't like heat. So if like the earth heated up, then I guess there'd be less ticks. Yeah, well, that's true. Well, well what's happening is that they're, they're moving further north into Canada. So their habitat is not, it, it might be being eliminated from one place, but it's becoming more suitable somewhere else. So we're seeing this northward expansion in part because of, for that reason, and just part because of you know, uh, how how they're being spread by by um, birds, most likely. Um, so we're seeing the spread into Canada. Oh, so they're migrating? Yeah, and I, I'm not sure that I, maybe, I, maybe I'll go on the record and say, I'll take, uh, I'll take a tick-borne disease problem over the potential problems that could arise from extreme warming. Is that, is that a controversial statement? I gotta be careful what I'm saying. I'm on TV, I'm gonna be on YouTube, but I think I'd rather take the ticks, I don't know. Maybe, I'll, I'll hedge my bets here. Um, what do you, but it's a great question. I get, I get your point, Caitlin, it's a really good question. What do you think about handling the new approach uh, to ticks on moose? I've heard that the state of Vermont is allowing more moose hunting permits with the thought that the moose populations will go down enough that the tick population will also go down, right? So. Um, if there's a hunt and you reduce the density of moose, it's gonna reduce the ability of the tick to spread from moose to moose. What do I think about that? I, 
I have no opinion. Um, uh, the, 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 the question is, which is going to be better for the moose population, right? Are we going to save more moose through a hunt or by not hunting? And I, I don't know enough about the science there to really chime in, um, but the, I know the people working on this problem know what they're talking about. Um, and the, any kind of scientific research or intervention comes through a collaborative effort with a lot of thought and consideration. So it is not just a sort of, um, you know, sitting around the table and thinking up an idea and implementing it, it's carefully considered. So if there were that sort of hunt, um, that would be because they, they think it's, it's the best possible route to take. But I don't really, I haven't read enough to really give you an opinion there. Um, and thank you, Rachel. Uh, Rachel, you have to tell me where that honeysuckle is. You can tell me that later. How do you know if it's a tick hurting a moose or brain worm? Oh, right. Well, that's a um, great question. And um, through the behavior, uh, I think brain worm um, causes a certain behavior in the moose that's characteristic. And when you, I've never seen the winter tick on moose, but I've had it, heard it described and I've seen pictures and it's very obvious when there are ticks crawling out of moose. There's so many um, and you can't miss it. You don't even need to be a tick. If you are aware that it could be a tick and you see the moose, you'll, you'll probably, it'll probably be very clear. Um, but that's what's, and if the moose is, has died, you, you, if it's fresh enough, you might see it find those ticks. Uh, yeah, Jana, by the way, I know we're wrapping up. I just want to say um, until today, it was NV, uh, University of Vermont. I gave a talk there a few years ago. And I got more questions than ever before. Um, but now um, you, you win. All right, this is so many questions. I wasn't, I wasn't ready because usually I don't get a lot of questions just because, so this is awesome. In a good way, I wasn't ready, okay? So thank you so much. Uh, for um, for uh, all your great questions. Uh, yeah, Jonna. I was just going to more along the lines uh, give a comment. If, if a species loses its source of food, um, they'll probably resort to another another species. Right. Yeah, tell me now, how, now what were you thinking there in terms of the black-legged tick or... Um, well, the moose situation, um, you know, if, if, if they don't have a moose to, to feed on them, um, they'll obviously migrate to find new sources of, of food or die off, but most likely they'd find new sources of food. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. And so we're, we're going to do some intervention. And then what is the outcome? Um, and there's a whole history of this in um, management strategies. Um, there are lots of um, great examples from Australia where you try to manage one outbreak by introducing a species to take care of it and it leads to another problem, right? And um, so that's a really good point. Um, yeah, thank you. What else? Uh, yeah, Lauren. Have you taken a DNA, DNA sample from a tick with Lyme? That there's say that uh, can we get a DNA sample from? Have you ever taken a DNA sample of a tick with Lyme disease? And thought I've ever had a a, a a sample from a tick that's carrying the Lyme disease pathogen. Yes, all that's um I would say about um now my study sites are in Rutland County, Vermont, near Green Mountain College, and depending on the site, twenty to fifty percent of the ticks are carrying it. Um. For, those are the nymphs, and the nymphs have only had one blood meal. If you look at adults, adults have had two blood meals, so two chances, and so the rate could be 60% or higher. It's very, very common, and I don't know what the infection rate is up here, but it's probably similar. So if you get a tick bite, um, I would say there's, uh, there's a, a, um, a good percent, there's a, there's a strong chance that it's carrying the pathogen. And then it, for it to pass it on to you, it has to be attached for a certain amount of time. Sometimes people will say it needs to be attached for 24 hours or more because there's a physiological change that takes place in the, in the bacteria before it can infect you. Um, but I don't know for sure that that's hard and fast. It could, perhaps it could take less than 24 hours. 
Um, but the, the good news is that if you have a tick bite, don't panic, just remove it as soon as you can. It's not, you've got some time. I've had tick bites um, that I missed of the tick and I pulled it out the next day and the, the nymph had a little bit of blood in it and I did not um, acquire the disease. And, and um, well, I don't know if it was infected or not, but um, so, so you have tick checks are really a good way to um, prevent Lyme disease. Um, I found a tick in the summer. It didn't bite yet, like, like they crawl around. Um, ticks are so little, how much blood can they suck? Well, that's, um, so if you come by the lab, I can show you, I happen to have an engorged tick. It's dead in alcohol that we picked off a bear uh, that, um, uh, and, and you can see, I can show you how big they are. They will um, really blow up like a jelly bean size, the adults. And for the nymphs, like a, a small, like a, like a Tic Tac, something like that, roughly. So they, they really go through, a, they look radically different when they have their blood meal. But do you recommend getting tested as soon as finding a tick stuck to you? And I, I, I should probably avoid the medical advice. Um, uh, so if, if you could ask me later, and, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what I would do is individually, but probably not. I'm not going to do that here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I've been warned not to do, uh, uh, I shouldn't give, I'm not a doctor, right? <laughs> well, we are right at 515 and it does, I don't see any more questions rolling in, but feel free to stay if um, Dr. Lansman has more time to ask more questions sure. or find him. He is in Bentley. Come visit us over here as soon as we can um, start interacting and socializing again hopefully soon um so thank you so much this was a great kickoff to our current topics in science season and it's really exciting to know that these opportunities are on campus for students so i highly recommend everybody um go check out the lab go see what else is going on down there and um i will see you next week next week we'll also be on zoom um but you know keep an eye on the modules and the announcements for any updates um thank Thank you everybody and I hope you have a very safe um, and great rest of the week. I'll see you next time.